Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for uh, yeah for the opportunity to presenting uh, presenting today here. The presentation was uh, scheduled to last for twenty five minutes, so I will try to reduce to till uh, fifteen minutes, just to allow everybody to go for lunch as soon as possible. So I will try to present today about uh, read and risk communication and the experience in Sweden. Actually, this uh, presentation is has been very interesting for me because I have got more knowledge about uh, the radon programs in, in Sweden after I moved to work here at Radonova uh, four years ago. Um, so uh, the structure of the presentation, I will speak a little bit about the radon in Sweden, how we do radon measurements uh, in the country, <clears throat> different campaigns, and we will end up with some data and results. Yeah. Uh, I, I always like to start talking uh, when I present about radon with this slide. Uh, it's all about risk. So radon exposure is a risk and it, there is a risk of uh, getting a lung cancer after a long-term radon exposure. So we need to keep this in mind that we are talking about risk, about probabilities. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sweden uh, has a long-term experience on radon measurements. Uh, I, it's, I used to say that in the northern countries, I would say Scandinavia and Ireland, the UK, uh, these countries, they have a very, very long tradition of uh, radon measurements uh, since many, many years, uh, compared with other countries in other parts of Europe with less uh, experience on radon measurements uh, and especially less experience on commercial radon measurements and mitigations. So in the Nordic countries and in particular in Sweden, uh, there is a uh, yeah, long tradition of both on radon measurements and radon mitigations as well. But things have changed a lot over the last uh, 15 years, since 2005 till now, 2021. And remember that we were using CDs in 2005, now we use Spotify, we use Netflix, HBO. So things have changed a lot, also in terms of radon. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the radon uh, measurement protocol in the country in Sweden, here you can see uh, a brief overview of how we do the things uh, here. First of all, uh, the user purchases a radon detector by an accredited laboratory, ISO 17025, and in most of the cases, the detectors are delivered by post. We place out the detector minimum in two rooms, in the property and two, two detectors if there is only one room, as is the case in many, many, many times. At, after the end of the exposure, which usually runs at least two months, the user returns the detectors to the analysis lab and uh, the user will get the results and compare with the reference level. Uh, the radon measuring system in the country is the winter season, which uh, extends from the 1st of October till the 30th of April. Uh, we don't have, uh, it's important to remark in Sweden, we don't have seasonal correction factors. So this is why uh, the authority recommends to measure during the winter season, which is supposed to be the most, uh, yeah, the, the, the worst conditions uh, for having radon at home. We expect to have the higher levels during the winter time. Uh, over the years, there have been different uh, radon awareness campaigns in the country, and I will refer to the campaigns uh, uh, that have been running since 2000. And in 2000, there were two different uh, initiatives, the ELIF campaign and the radon investigation. So the ELIF survey was a research program uh, about the power consumption in populated areas, and uh, as a result, it, of this uh, survey, it was discovered that uh, in small houses, approximately 18% of the houses had a radon levels above 200 becquerels a meter cube. In the case of the apartments, the, the percentage was a little bit uh, different, almost half, around 8%, 10% of the apartments. And uh, the reduction on the radon levels was 30% 30, 30 after the introduction of the uh, radon limits in small houses and again, half of the percentage in the case of the apartments. 
<clears throat> uh, uh, the written survey was a survey, uh, a writing survey, uh, sending documents to all the municipalities in the country. Uh, just for you to know, there are around 290 municipalities in Sweden. And uh, these uh, documents were sent to the municipalities during the year 2000, just to get an overview of the written situation in the country. The results were uh, that uh, in the case of the small houses, a little bit higher uh, percentage as before, 35% were above 200 per kilometer meter cube and around 30, 28% were above 200 per kilometer meter cube. So uh, what are the learnings from these uh, two experiences? So uh, in terms of the measurements, we need to say that the municipalities had concentrated the measurements in those buildings with uh, radioactive building materials. Let's say the famous blue concrete or buildings located in high radon risk areas. What is a high radon risk areas in Sweden? It is a place where the radon levels in the soil are above 50,000 becquerel per meter cube at one meter deep. This is considered as a high risk areas. Uh, and some of the concluding remarks <clears throat> from both campaigns is that, yeah, it's not always the case that the, the new uh, constructions uh, and the new modern construction companies will follow the rules uh, in terms of uh, radon proof. So this was one of the, of, the, of the conclusions. Let's move on a little bit on time until 2014 and then Buberket uh, run another uh, campaign. Buberket is, uh, stands for the Swedish National Board of Housing, Building and Planning. And it is an authority in the government. And together with the local administrations, uh, they uh, managed to introduce a so-called Radon Grant for remediation. This grant at the moment is under discussion in the parliament uh, for the budget for the next year. But uh, so far, there was this Radon Grant, uh, which means around 2,500 euro that uh, people, citizens can get from the government to help uh, in the Radon mitigation work. And it will cover 50% of the cost. And as maximum, the citizen can get 2,500 euro. Uh, in Sweden, there are many agencies responsible for Radon. And you can see here in the slide uh, a summary of all the responsible agencies in the country. We have the Work Environment Authority. As I said before, we have the Buberket, the National Board of Housing, Building and Planning. Of course, uh, the Public Health Agency of Sweden, which is nowadays extremely popular, as you can imagine, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have the communes. Uh, they have some responsibility also in terms of radon, more than 290 communes all across the country. The food agency, uh, county administrative boards of Sweden, the geological survey, SWEDAC is the accreditation body in Sweden uh, in charge of uh, controlling, doing the audits, in particular for uh, verifying the ful fulfillment of the ISO standard 17025 in the analysis and the testing labs. And finally, we have the Swedish Radiation safety authority. So nine agencies responsible uh, for radon in Sweden working together. Uh, this uh, survey ran in 2014 called the Buberket survey had different questions. I have uh, reduced a little, some of the slides and I would like to keep this question. Do you consider radon when buying a house? This is very important because it shows a little bit the impact of, of, the, of the campaigns in the Swedish population. I, say, I can say that, yeah, the results are quite uh, good if we compare with other countries. Around 44% consider radon when they are buying a house, when they take the decision to buy a house. In addition to that, 47% answer no, but they realize that there is a risk after the purchase. So in gen generally speaking, we can say that approximately 90% of the people uh, participating in the survey consider radon in a way or another. Only 10%, 9% uh, answered that no, they didn't think about radon at all. 
Uh, finally, in 2017, uh, the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority uh, ran another campaign uh, among the householders. So uh, the, 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 the aim of this survey was to measure the awareness in term, the radon awareness in the country and the attitude of the Swedish population. So to do this survey, they used uh, randomly uh, selected people by means of uh, phone interviews, general public, homeowners, a little bit less than 2,000 interviews. And of course, they considered all the different weighting factors, the type of the dwelling, the size of the how of the property, the age, the gender, uh, different, different factors. Um, yeah, there were very interesting outcomes uh, from this survey. First of all, this is important. Among the young people, the knowledge of radon is very, very small, uh, which is normally, this is normally the case. Young people are less aware of risk. So maybe this is one of the reasons why they don't care a lot about, about, about radon. Uh, yeah, the widespread spread awareness of the threat means that a few were very, very worried about the radon, but important fact is that people were unaware. They didn't know that radon can, that water can be a radon source as well. And also in the case of the rental apartments, the, the uh, people living in these properties, they were also unaware of radon. Uh, about radon in your home, uh, yeah, some people had very little knowledge about the presence of the blue concrete as a building material in the, in the property. Important is the outcome that as people move to new homes, either they take the decision to buy a new house or, or to change the property. It seems that they care more about radon because there is an increase of the radon awareness in this, uh, in this type of people. Uh, yeah, one out of four uh, did a radon measurement and there is no worth uh, cost of radon remediation. These were, these were the main outcomes of this uh, survey. And some conclusions. Of course, the first conclusion is very obvious. More knowledge is needed. And I guess this is a conclusion that we can extend also to the UK and uh, in general or around the world. So we need more knowledge about radon and especially more knowledge about uh, among the young people. I am doing that. I am always talking at home with my son about radon. But apart from the joke, I think it is very important to start uh, with the young people, maybe starting a sort of a radon training programs in schools or high schools, trying to introduce this uh, radon topic in the programs of, of the schools to increase the awareness among this sector of the population. Of course, we need to do more uh, work to ex better explain the different radon sources and where to ask for advice. And this uh, conclusion is more or less in connection with the presentation of Aaron this morning women are more aware about radon than men and uh, young people uh, young women are more aware than all women and uh, yeah uh, i will conclude now with some data and some results uh, yeah this is also something that aaron presented already in the morning in sweden uh, the good thing is that the new uh, dwellings the new construction techniques manage to reduce the radon levels. You can see here uh, a graph about radon levels and foundation times, types in single family homes and multifamily houses, uh, depending if the, yeah, the foundation type is basement, split level, crawl space, or a slab on grade. But in all the cases, the radon, the average radon concentration decreases with the time. At the moment today, uh, most Swedish single family houses are built with a slab on grade in the, in the foundations. And you can see here also the decrease in the concentrations, radon concentrations in the new build, so these buildings in different decades. And the same in the case of the multifamily houses. Uh, here we can compare the radon levels with the different ventilation types. You can see in, in the red color, balanced mechanical ventilation, green color, poor mechanical ventilation, and uh, blue color, just a natural ventilation. 
Uh, in terms of the number of measurements, I will say this is, uh, yeah, this is quite impressive when compared with other countries. Uh, a lot of measurements are done in Sweden every year. And here you can see the approximate, approximate number of measurements uh, in both type of properties in single family homes and multifamily houses. So uh, over the last, uh, we'll say the last uh, yeah, 20 years or so. And this is probably the most remarkable result, how the average radon levels decrease over the time. So we can, we started with, uh, yeah, around 184 average radon concentration in single family homes. And nowadays we are in 167 uh, becquerel meter cube. So we can see a reduction in the number of the, in the radon concentrations over the time. To conclude, uh, the results of the campaigns, the results and the experience in Sweden over the years shows that there is a better and more uniform building practice. So it seems that the building techniques are, uh, are getting to the target and are getting the aim of reducing the radon levels indoors. In most of the Swedish dwellings, dwellings the mechanical or the balanced ventilation uh, are uh, used in most of the Swedish buildings. The campaigns uh, take time, efforts of people and also money. So you need to invest a public funding on these campaigns, but there is an effect. We can see that the good effect is a reduction on the average radon levels. And this is also in connect. I would like to connect this with the previous speaker, with Rebecca. Uh, she said that the, the main goal of everybody involved in radon, uh, testing companies or, or remediation companies, authorities, is to reduce the threat. So to reduce the number of lung cancer cases per year. So by means of this type of campaigns, it seems that we are getting closer and closer to this, to this goal. So the campaigns are a very good tool. Uh, to increase the radon, the radon awareness among the population. And the last sentence, it's, it's, I, I like this, especially coming from my, my experience from, from my home country in Spain, where it's not always easy to find this coordination uh, among the different government agencies, but it seems, it seems that in Sweden it's a little bit better. So there is a good coordination among the different agencies in charge of different things connected with radon, and this is not an easy task. So I think uh, I spent already 15, 16 minutes. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Here you have my contact details. So if you want uh, further information, please just uh, send me an email, give me a call or yeah, whatever you need. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Jose. And thank you for helping us catch up a little bit. Um, I hope you didn't have to miss too much out. Um, loads of really interesting um, things in there. We've got a couple of questions if you just want to keep your microphone on um, for another minute or so. So um, lots to be learnt from other countries um, and yeah really glad that you could share the experience from Sweden. Um, so I've got a question here and um, that says have you found communication of radon and the radon risk um, is similar in every country so will what we're doing in the UK and how it's received do you think it'll be similar to what you found in Sweden or Canada? <laughs> yeah this is a good question well I, I will say uh, yeah I can I can answer from my experience uh, compared with Spain, for instance, or uh, yeah, I will say the answer is not. So it's it's not the same. The communication depend, depends very much. I will say on the cultural background of the on the country. So it's actually a cultural thing. So I am I am very impressed with all the efforts that you do in the UK, uh, for instance, over the years with all these awareness. Also in your neighbor in Ireland, they are very good as well on communication. But I will say uh, it's not the same case in other countries. Uh, again, my home country in Spain, it's very difficult uh, to communicate uh, the risk coming from Radon, uh, even though we have already legislation to do that. But it's uh, still a long way to go. So uh, I will say, in my experience, the best countries doing this are the Nordic countries, UK, Ireland, Canada. These are very, very good examples. Yes, well, I think, I think we can all do more. Um, and there's, absolutely. There's all, yeah, there's, there's absolutely. we can all learn from each other as well. Yeah. I do think, uh, yeah, this whole session on risk communication here, what Aaron was saying earlier, uh, in the wake of the pandemic, um, people, we've got a lot of 
armchair epidemiologists now, people who have become more aware of risk and how risk is being communicated to them and are perhaps engaging more with public health services um, right. might now be yeah, more receptive to seeing, oh, what, what am I being told? What does that mean to me? Um, so um, there, I've got one quick question here as well. I saw on your slides um, when you said about the number of tests that have been doing in um, Sweden and that had gone up impressively every year, and particularly the multifamily home the number of tests that have been carried out in the last few years in multifamily homes seems to have gone up significantly. Do you have legislation? And is that enforced? Is that the driving factor? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there is no legislation to do. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, it's it's um, compulsory to measure in these multifamily homes, actually, so that the owner of the of the property is responsible for that. And uh, yeah, I think this is a game changer, absolutely. But now there is an increase also in the number of measurements at the workplaces. I didn't talk about this uh, due to the European directive as well. It's all parts of the puzzle to reduce exposure. Mm. So, okay, thank you very much for that, Jose.